Let's welcome in the House Majority Leader, Delegate Eric Householder, who joins us by phone from the Capitol. Eric, good morning to you, sir. Well, good morning and bur- and happy birthday. Uh, I know uh, Delegate Kump was visiting me here this morning, and I had to usher him out. I said, hey, I'm getting ready to be on the ra- radio with Rob and the gang. And, he's, and he was like, well, today's his birthday. Wish him a happy birthday from him. So <laughs> Delegate Kump also says happy birthday. So. See, Larry so, knew, John. So, so Larry got the memo. Yeah. John didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Everybody else seemed to know. <laughs> well, I didn't know until Delegate Kump brought it to my team. I was going to search Facebook there real quick to find out. So, But happy birthday. So. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. I, yeah. I was yeah. thinking about you this weekend when I was uh, back yeah. uh, around my hot water tank. Um, <laughs> and that's how I think of you now. <laughs> I thought, so I, I remember the last time I had to deal with this hot water tank, I, I, I called Eric Householder like at 1030 at night on a Saturday and said, my pilot light is out. Can you help me light the pilot <laughs> right. light? So, yeah, we FaceTime one another and we got you through it. So, yeah, good. All good stuff. How many House majority leaders around this country in the 50 states do that for people? Huh? Not many. I don't and, know. And, I don't and, know. And also, I think I think I remember that Eric had volunteered to come over and light it for he you. He actually did, and then realized yes, yes. how far far away you live, and then he changed right. his mind. Should <laughs> <laughs> we make sure. it clear that that's his business? It's just not the service of being a uh, the House Majority Leader. You go out and, and fix pilot right, lights. Right, no, right, you can call right. the House Majority Leader for anything, regardless. <laughs> he'll, 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 he'll help you. He'll talk you through it. So, Plumbing or HVAC, that's right. That's so. right, all of that. Um, we, and, and that includes tax cuts, uh, too, Eric. And, and let's uh, call you, and maybe you can talk us through this now. Uh, we had Craig on, uh, the Senate President, Craig Blair, on Friday. And he had issue, took issue with a lot of the governor's mm-hmm. spending. He also was, didn't seem like he wanted to agree to a 30% now, 10%, 10%. He wants 50% now. Eric, can you guys get on the same page from there? Absolutely. And I did get a chance to listen to it, um, his uh, interview on Friday. And uh, I think you guys did a very good job asking the right questions and and to push the Senate president on what decisions that the Senate is going to make. And from what I gathered from that conversation, from what I heard, that the Senate president, Blair, would be uh, would be happy to see a 50 percent first year. So I'm here to let your listeners know if that's the direction that the Senate wants to go, bring it on. Send it back to us. We would gladly accept it. You know, and I've had conversations with with the governor that, uh, you know, it is a part of a compromise. Uh, I know Senator Blair mentioned, President Blair mentioned that on one Sunday he walked in and he saw me, the majority leader, and the speaker, and the, the 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 chairman of finance walking out of the governor's mansion. That was on Sunday. That was the first time that we heard of the governor's plan. And uh, when the governor spoke about it, I said, "Hey, I like it. Uh, I, I'm, you know, we're all on board. The House is eager to pass tax cuts. And for your listeners, I mean, I've I've been on this journey for the last four years. So for four years, I have sent different variations over." Uh, to our Senate colleagues, and it all started when Roger Hanshaw became speaker, and, and he wanted to, you know, our slogan was to, to to live, work, and raise a family. So he wanted to better, he wanted us uh, chairmen at the time to come up with plans to make to make the lives of West Virginia easier, to raise a family, and to work, and to stay in West Virginia. So one of the things I had mentioned to the speaker back then, four years ago, was personal income tax cuts. So so we started on this journey. The first time, the first plan that I sent over to the Senate was just a straight $150 million a year tax cut because I kept arguing, well, the natural growth in revenue was $150 million. They said, no, that wasn't big enough. So the second year, actually the second year was a little bit bigger and bolder plan, uh, but it still, it took 10 to 25 years to, to, in order to eliminate the entire personal income tax. Now, keep in mind, the whole time the House kept insisting on, hey, let's see if we can eliminate personal income taxes without doing any tax shifting or any tax increases. Well, when you do something like that, it's very, very difficult to try to find out, you know, come up with a way to eliminate something without doing any tax shifting. If you're going to do something, it would take a very long time, and you're hoping for a lot of dynamic growth and, and increase in revenue. It can be done, but like I said, it could take 
10, 15, 20 some years. Uh, the third year came about, I uh, refreshed the one that I just spoke about, but made it a little bit bigger where we had a, uh, a safer fund where we started having triggers in the bill and, and we would take revenue coming into the state and drive it down into the safer, safer fund. We would take expenses on the expense side of the budget. We would cut money and stick it down into the safer fund. And, and once the safer fund uh, reached 300 million, that was your backstop. Anything over three hundred million, that was to be used for tax cuts. And then eventually, the fourth year, I just did something safe. I said, "Okay, I haven't been too successful with those other three proposals. How about just a plain Jane ten percent across the board tax cut?" And I said, "You know, I'm also going to go one step farther. I'm going to put ten percent for future tax cuts in the back, in the uh, back of the budget." You know, because I kept hearing hey, everybody was scared of ARPA, the clawback, and I kept saying, hey, look, our revenue is exceeding 2019, which was the base year. And then Patrick Morrissey was out there, you know, saying, hey, look, this 13 state coalition, we're going to win, we're going to win. I said, hey, let's not be concerned about it. I think we're going to be okay. And uh, so all these all these attempts have failed. Now, like I said, the governor came out with this proposal, and uh, I do believe that the numbers are sound. And uh, I think it's a, a first start. Whatever the Senate would like to do, if they want to modify it, modify it, send it back to us. We're ready and eager to look at it. Eric, before I go to Bill here, uh, we, we yeah. talked about this in a previous conversation. Uh, I want to do the math here for a second. What, yes. One percent of a, of a personal income tax cut in West Virginia is equal to what? And one percent of a sales tax cut yes. is equal to what? All right, so the rule of thumb, a 1% personal income tax cut is worth about $400 million. A 1% sales tax increase is approximately $300 million. That's the rule of thumb. Very good. Okay, Bill. Yeah, uh, good morning, Mr. Leader. Glad to uh, good morning, talk to you Bill. this morning. Uh, I need some, some help. Uh, yeah. you, you listened on Friday, and uh, with the uh, Senate president, I heard him say first – the Senate was going to do the due diligence. Can we afford a tax cut? And I had anticipated him to go through the very safety features that uh, that you kind of some of the same safety features you just mentioned. And then he pivoted and said, if the, if we could reduce the 50 percent personal tax reduction from a three year to a one year, he would be all in favor of that. Now, to me, these are two completely different things, two contrasting things. What did you come away with what he was saying? I, I, I feel that you described that scenario exactly how I heard it. Uh, I think you pushed the issue pretty well, and, and you asked him point blank, uh, do you want 50%? Because you kept saying, hey, uh, I'm confused here. 50% is 30, 10, 10, and the Senate president suggested that no. In order to have greater impact in the state, you need to have 50% the first year. And I, I'm fine with that. Um, and for your listeners, you know, can we do tax cuts? I, I think the choice is clear. Right now, we have an opportunity. So the question is, do you advocate for higher taxes and larger government? Or do we want to take the opportunity and reward our citizens by helping them since they've been pulling the rope all these years? Think about this. Our budget right now that the governor introduced to us is $4.8 billion. And now we're on target to have projected surplus of $1.8 billion. So if you add those two together, we've generated five point, or excuse me, $6.6 billion worth of tax revenue. Do we have the money to pay for this? Yes. If we don't have tax cuts, what do you think is going to happen to the $1.8 billion surplus? It's going to be spent. It's going to be spent on something. Who knows what? It'll mostly be base building items. I, now, the governor, uh, now in Craig's defense and President Blair's defense, he did mention uh, that we have to prioritize spending. He's absolutely correct. Of that projected $1.8 billion, the governor has decided to put $1.3 billion in the back of the budget, which is called the general revenue surplus section. 
Well, I've been advocating for many years. It's the legislature's role to determine spending, not the governor's role. Uh, we appropriate the money so we can say yes to his $1.3 billion, or we can say no and pick and choose what we want. That's our role. But yes, Bill, that's what I heard, that the Senate was e eager to have a 50% tax cut. Uh, I'm concerned what what are they going to do after that? Are they going to implement sales taxes? I don't know the answer to that. I feel like that's what they're alluding to, but it's basically a non-starter in the House. Uh, I have grown to say over the years, as I have studied this, that consumption taxes, and this is only me speaking, this is not our caucus, I have said over the years that uh, when I first started down this journey that, yes, I would be opposed to a 2% sales tax, but I've realized that if you really sit down and think about how much money you're spending on sales taxes, it's very, very small. You would be lucky if you're spending $30 a month. I mean, there's no tax on food. There's no tax on prescription medicines. The only tax there is, obviously, is on durable goods. Uh, you know, when you go to the grocery store and buy durable goods or if you go to Lowe's and so forth. Um, you know, I, I, I've often advocated that if you're going to raise the sales tax, save it for the next 50 percent that you're trying to eliminate. I don't think that you need to do it now, but uh, I'm eager to see what the Senate's going to send over to us. OK, yeah, thank you. So uh, uh, so my point was I was hearing two different messages. Certainly the second message we heard was that uh, the Senate president would be agreeable if we could collapse the the three years down to one year uh yeah and, and i gather the the first part of what he was talking about was due diligence and i think i applaud everybody for doing due diligence but it's but i was glad and, to hear and let me trigger. expand well, yeah. let me expand on that so the first year the cost is 800 million year two another 250 million year three another 250 million so overall 1.3 i think the fiscal note was right around uh, $1.4 billion when you implement it fully after three years. So let's just assume that the fiscal note was right. So what the Senate president is advocating is that you would have a $1.4 billion tax cut immediately uh, this year, retroactive starting January 1 of this year. Now, the way the bill sent, was sent over to the Senate, there's only $163 million cost this year, this budget cycle that we're in, because remember, our budget cycle runs from July 1 and ends June 30th. So you would have to pick up the first six months of this year, 2023, and account for six months of it, which is about $163 million cost out of the $1.4 billion cost overall. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And thanks for uh, explaining that again. Uh, I was a little surprised that uh, uh, some sniping between the two uh, two bodies took place when he said that he did not think the House did there uh, was thoughtful and was careful before they passed the bill to you. I, I was not sure that was really called for. Well, and keep in mind, President Blair and I, we served on a tax reform committee for two years in 2015 and all of 2016. Uh, there's been study after study. Uh, the under Governor Underwood did a study. Uh, Senator Manchin, uh, at the time when he was governor, Governor Manchin had did a study. And now we completed another study. Uh, the House has been eager to do tax cuts for four years. Uh, to say that we didn't do our due diligence, that's not true. Um, I mean, I would remind the senator um, they passed 26 bills the very first day of the session, and you could argue that some of the new senators were disenfranchised over those bills. They never actually saw them before. Now, Craig will argue, hey, these are bills that the Senate has passed before. Well, yeah, that's true. That's correct. But there's a lot of new senators that might not have seen those bills, never for the first time, and now they're on the House or, excuse me, on the Senate floor, floor passing them. They're not going through committees. But, uh, no, the House has been working on this for four years. We've done our due diligence. We're ready. We're eager. We're trying to give money back uh, to our citizens. I uh, know Senate President Blair has told me many, many times, Householder, pass whatever you can. Get whatever you can across the finish line. We'll pass it. Well, I've done it for four years, and we're here we are. I keep sending every variation over to them. So let's see what happens now. John Gilstrap. Good morning, Leader Householder. Um, I, Good morning. I'm, I'm just confused. I hear all of these 
uh, the the objections. There's a lot of fear out there that that the uh, surpluses are based on sort of transient prosperity with increased uh, uh, energy prices and, and what have you. And then we hear the fear that we don't know that we can pay for all of the agencies. We don't know that we can have the, the uh, pay increases for some of the public workers and, and what have you. And then I, I listen to, to you and mm-hmm. your, I mean, your command of the number seems to be right spot on. Is there a lot of sandbagging going on here? Do you think that the the express concerns are are really from the heart? Well, John, if you continue to have a flatline budget, remember you're controlling the rate of spending, and when you do that, you're going to have higher surpluses. So, currently, if we're projecting surpluses to be 1.7 billion, and then the whole financial market goes awry and and the, our energy prices start to drop and you lose 500 million dollars that because if you heard me say before on this station that normally we generate about 400 million dollars a year in severance taxes but now we're seeing up around 800 so we're generating 400 more because energy prices are high so if you lost four or five um, hundred million dollars you still would be down around a surplus of at least a billion dollars the, the Senate Republicans and House Republicans, along with this governor, has done a good job overall to keep a flat budget and to prioritize and control the rate of spending. Here's the real question. The flatline budget has generated about $3.6 billion in surpluses. Uh, the question becomes, are we ready to do a tax cut? Most of us, as you saw, the vote total in the House was 95 to 2. The House says yes. Um, I know the Senate is concerned. I've heard the Senate many times say, hey, look, whenever I would give a cautious, more moderate approach, I would hear, well, that's too slow. We've got to have a big splash. And said, I'd send something over. Was it still a cautious, more moderate approach? No, we need a big splash. So now we've got a big splash, and now I'm hearing a different story. Well, we've got to be cautious. Well, okay. What do you want to do here? Just modify it, send it back over to us. What I'm afraid that could happen, the longer that we wait to pass tax cuts, that gives the legislature more ideas to spend the money, and that's what concerns me. Yeah, uh, Eric, uh, flatline budget is something I think we've, we've all benefited from, but there's been some downside. The downside has been the salaries of state workers. We've been hearing the regional jail folks are uh, underpaid, the police, teaching the whole bit. Is there an, uh, is it time to start making some modifications to the flatline budget to compensate these individuals that are so poorly paid? I don't think so, because having a flatline budget, we've been able to do three teacher pay raises and, and, and with state workers. So each one of those state workers that you mentioned, even corrections, each every year has seen a 5% increase. Last year, we decided for CPS workers to give them an immediate bump of 15%. Uh, this year, we're going to take care of correctional officers. Uh, a tenth, and last year we also took care of state troopers. So, what you the smart way to do it is just to pick and choose, and, and you know you, it's much harder to do when you try to do everybody. Now you're talking several hundred million of dollars versus okay the correctional pay raise bill that we're running through committee that's that's actually now up in finance is about a thirty million dollar cost. Well, that's a lot easier to uh, you know to uh, have it meld into a 4.8 billion dollar budget as opposed to something that's three or four hundred million dollars. So that's that's you know you want to have a more moderate approach when it comes to some of these pay raises. But uh, overall, I think we've done a great job, uh, you know, bringing these uh, wages up to a level. Um, you know, we're trying. So, Eric, I think uh, from our listeners' perspective, and certainly from mine, this yes. dispute, which is, sounds more like kind of what it is than a disagreement, uh, if it was between the uh, Senate uh, president from uh, maybe uh, McDowell County and the House Majority Leader from Berkeley County, the great distance, the cultural differences between the two ends of the state, we could see it. But you both are Berkeley County people who've known each other for a yes. long time. Can this be just as simple as, hey, 
Eric or, hey, Craig, let's get together for dinner tomorrow night and flesh out the differences and fix this mess? Well, we had dinner last night. We met with uh, Russ Sobel. Uh, we do have breakfast every Thursday along with the governor's staff, the House and the Senate. And uh, the last two meetings, uh, I have agreed with Senate President Blair that we need to sit down and say, okay, of this $1.8 billion, let's prioritize our spending. Uh, right now, the governor wants $1.3. What do we feel is necessary out of the $1.3 that the governor? What spending are we able to say, okay, we're complete in agreement on? And before that, uh, I guess what Senator Blair is saying, before he proceeds any further, that's the route that he would like to go. And uh, I heard him mention a few things, which seems to be moving on both sides, both houses. One, uh, Senator Blair mentioned about hospital reimbursement rates of $40 million. He mentioned a $100 million for the uh, uh, rainy day PEIA fund. Uh, he mentioned... Uh, K through three uh, aids for kindergarten through third grade for to help in reading proficiency. That's about a hundred million dollars. So all told, there's about four hundred and fifty million dollars worth of spending that I see that both sides are willing anywhere from two sixty to four fifty. So we just got to sit down and, sig- and figure out where where that sweet spot is, and then I think the uh, the Senate will be. Uh, much happier once we come to an agreement on spending, then they will say, okay, this is what the income tax cut cut bill should look like. Hopefully they'll send it back to us. All right. uh, Eric, project this forward another 40 legislative days and tell me, do we leave this session with the income tax bill passed or does this sound like something that's going to take a special session to do, if at all? No, I hope we leave this session with an income tax cut. Um, I know the Senate is... It's signaling a little bit they want to bring tax experts in. Um, You know, I'm still trying to stay optimistic. Uh, Like I said, you know, I can read your comments just as well as everybody else. Like I said, for your listeners, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. Uh, I don't know what more I can do as far as saying come to the table. You know, I've followed uh, Senate President Blair's remarks by sending him over something. I've done that for four years. I'm willing to negotiate. I'm willing to compromise. I'm willing to do whatever I can to help settle their fears if they have any fears. But I'm here to tell you that it's projected the next four years, if you keep a flat budget, you will have $1.2 billion surplus. There's no reason why we can't do income tax cuts. Eric, is the per, personal relationship between the governor and the Senate leadership getting in the way on this? In this, Well, I say yes, but I did hear Blair's, uh, President Blair say no. But uh, I do think there's some animosity, especially with uh, the Senate Finance Chairman, uh, Eric Tarr. I've seen still comments to, on Metro News, another news outlet, where he doesn't trust the governor, he doesn't trust uh, the revenue secretary, he doesn't trust the budget director. And the budget director used to be uh, one of the budget analysts when uh, Senate President Blair was the uh, Senate finance chair. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I keep hearing comments or seeing, reading comments, and I'm like, no, nah, you probably, probably shouldn't say that. You should bite your tongue. Uh, but... I think it uh, puts a strain on the relationship. I know the governor has been over and had a sit-down meeting with uh, President Blair. That's a start. I think that's the key. I think once those two, uh, uh, because they've been friends for the last six years, and they've always had a working relationship, and uh, I think if they can get all that Amendment 2 behind them, I think things will be better off. Eric, thanks so much for your time this morning. As always, very much appreciate it.